Well, good morning to all, and welcome to the College Church. Uh, we want to thank Ilana for her, you know, we're going to get spoiled here. Every week we get two mini concerts, so uh, we really appreciate it. Music is very, very important, and that brings me to uh, part of my announcements. You know, you may wonder, where did the hymnals go? And they've been put away. And the reason is, is because right now the prevailing thought is that even with masks on, we project our, our breath further and possibly can contaminate somebody else if, we were, if we we're a carrier. So what we're trying to do is to take that really important part of worship service, of singing, at least to add to it some other music. So, so far we've been able to make that work, and it's been a blessing. Um, but I'm saying this because worship is truly participatory. You know, worship is something where we participate. And, you know, we usually collect the offering. We're not doing that. We usually have uh, a time of, some of us do a meet and greet. We don't do that. And, of course, we do congregational singing, which that, we're not doing that either. So it's sort of a new paradigm and trust me, it frustrates me because the last thing we want is worship to be a spectator experience. You know what I'm saying? We're supposed to come here in body and in spirit and to be here. So we're making the best we possibly can with the situation. So that brings me to an announcement here. In my hand, I have a clipboard. And what I have here is a... A uh, bunch of blanks where I may come up to you and say, so and so, would you have the prayer next week? Would you have the scripture read next week? Maybe even the children's story. And because what we want to do is invite as many people as possible to participate in the worship service. So please keep that in mind. If you feel like you're willing to do something, you approach me, and, and we'll put your name on the list, because that would be a wonderful, wonderful moment. Um, I want to just recap some announcements here. Tuesday evening, we have a finance committee, and our finance committee chair is here with us this morning. He'll be in Maine uh, during that meeting. That's why we'll be using sort of a hybrid on Zoom. 
Tuesday evening it's a typo, but Tuesday evening is church board meeting via Zoom. Wednesday evening we have prayer meeting via Zoom, and and uh, we're just starting the book of Exodus. We're going to start looking at Exodus 1, 2, and 3. So if you miss Genesis, don't worry, just hop on board. There's about 18, 19, 20 of us, and uh, the link is on the website, and it will be on the Wednesday email. Um, so please uh, feel free to join us. It's a very good discussion, and we start at 7, and we end 7.05, I mean 8.05, 8.10, and uh, um, so it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And we're actually developing a, what would you say, it, a, a community there. And so it's been good. It's been good. I have a, a, an announcement. I'm just sharing this for your information. I received a um, letter from, in the mail from Fresh Start Moving Crew. They're looking for workers. And uh, they claim they, they claim they're, for, they're, they're a Christian company. And uh, they're looking for people who are able, able to be movers. Of course, the criteria is have to be able to lift 100 pounds. And uh, they have a pay rate here. So if you're looking for work, uh, I have a piece of paper here. And I can just give this to you. And uh, you can take it and do with it, whatever you'd like to with it. So I believe that covers for our announcements. Um, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes. And, uh, you know, we're discussing... Uh, how to resume the children's division Sabbath school classes so that those gears are turning and we're looking at the month of July and uh, that we're just going to need some wisdom on that and guidance. So why don't we bow our heads for prayer and uh, ask the Lord to bless our service. Father in heaven, Lord, it is good to come to the house of the Lord on the day of the Lord. And Lord, we are thankful that we're able to be here, and we're thankful that those who are not able to be, able, be here are, can join us via the Internet. Lord, wherever we may be, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be in our hearts. Lord, we pray that whether we're watching on a, on a phone or a computer screen or here, that our hearts will be opened. That we will open up our minds and our hearts and that we will seek you and only you. Oh Lord, all that is said and done here this morning, may it be to your glory. May it point to your love, may it point to your truth, may it point to your grace. Oh Lord, it is good to be here. It is good to be your children. It is good to have this time with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Today's scripture reading <clears throat> is from John 14, 4 through 6. That's John 14, 4 through 6. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I guess it's kind of appropriate that Lana played that song just before now. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to do something I hope I hope they're watching, that they would appreciate. And I'm talking about Dr. Bay and Dr. Bay, for those of you who do not know, there are two of them, and Dr. Kinney. And I know our Pathfinder leader, Jill Hodson. And I'm sure there's somebody I'm going to miss, and if I'm so, I'm sorry. But they are hired and paid to work on these things right here, your teeth, to make them look the best they can. Now, two, Dr. Bay and Dr. Kinney have retired, but that doesn't mean that they don't know how to still take care of someone's teeth. It just means they've reached that beautiful point in life where they don't have to. But I'm going to talk about something today that I hope would make them happy. Now, we all know what one of these are. This is a toothbrush. This is one of the retired toothbrushes in our family. And it has been used on many an occasion to make sure that our teeth look as pearly white as possible. Now, there comes a time, as we all know, that these start to lose their efficiency. They're not quite what they used to be. And instead of throwing away, in our family, we talk about replacing. And there's a reason we talk about replacing. And that's because in our family, these don't get thrown away. They may not get used on your teeth anymore, but they don't get thrown away. Which brings me to something else that should, should get thrown away, but we also kind of don't do that either. Now, these are a fairly recent addition to dental hygiene. Flossing has been around for years, and I admit, I'm probably a chronic over-flosser. I probably do it too much. But, one of these are fantastic, because you've got your little floss here, and then you can use this for the places you just seem to get something caught. And don't look, alike, don't look at me right now like you've never had popcorn. And four days later, all of a sudden, you find yourself going... Man, I, I know I brushed, I know I flossed. I, I, I am convinced that popcorn kernels have a way of wedging themselves somewhere up here and then waiting to slowly work their way back down here so it comes at the worst possible time. You're in a meeting and yet it's there and you can't stop it and people are looking going, why, is, why does he keep doing that? But you're supposed to use these, you clean your teeth and then when you're done you throw it away. Except I do don't throw it right away, because in my opinion, its usefulness is not over. Now I'm going to show you something that you probably don't see too often, if ever, in a church. This is a Husqvarna 455 Rancher chainsaw with a 20 inch bar. And I use this not as much as I'd like to because I kind of enjoy this. I come from logging territory. Central uh, Washington State was logger territory. 
I used to say I wasn't certain there was a full set of male fingers in the church I grew up in because they work in the logging industry and the sawmills and all that. And it, it was not uncommon to see someone get up front as they're talking. When we give back to the Lord and there was a finger missing, but I work with these because it's kind of still in my blood. And in order to keep your bar nice and clean and functioning properly, inside your bar in here, and I purposely didn't clean it because I wanted to make sure you knew that's a lie. I, I just haven't got around to cleaning it. In here is a little hole where the bar oil comes in and it keeps the grooves here oiled so the chain spins as, fluently as po fluidly as possible. However, at some point you're going to need to clean your chainsaw, which means you take these two bolts off here and remove this. And these things do a wonderful job of cleaning. Now, I used this one last Sunday at a church member's house because they needed something to come down. And I told Bill I was going to mention him because I've been to Bill Weischer's house on more than one occasion and put this thing to use. And he and I have dropped a few trees between the two of us. We, we, we know how to use one of these things. He has his, I have mine. And we, we're a pretty good tandem, if I do say so myself. But when it's done, I'll often take and I clean it all off. And then this thing does an excellent job of going in this groove and cleaning out and making sure that my chainsaw is ready for the next time I need to use that. And that's not the only thing that these things can do. I'm not going to put this one in my mouth because I honestly don't remember what I've used it for. But it's an excellent shoe polishing tool where you kind of get the cracks right there. And if you need afterwards, you clean it up. There's a lot of things that can clean up. And if you look around here, there are a lot of crafty, thrifty, creative individuals sitting out there right now who probably can think of many more uses for something like this or something like this before it finally loses its usefulness. And I say that for this reason. There are so many things that we take and say they're no longer good. We're a throwaway society. Why fix it? Because it's just as cheap to buy a different one. And I'm not up here preaching or telling you about you've got to make sure that you use everything to its full efficiency, but what I am telling you is that everyone, from the moment they're born to the day they die, has a use in the kingdom of God. And that doesn't, I don't care, I was out in the lobby just a bit ago, and if you're watching on Facebook, you know that Jessica is making sure that the hearing impaired can hear what's being said. She had her daughter out there. And her daughter is at that stage 10 months. Well, let's be honest. They need, they need, they need. But you know what? She gave me a little something this morning that I wouldn't have got otherwise. She didn't have one of these things on, and she looked up at me, and then she smiled. And a smile can make someone's day. So I don't care how old you are, a smile can make someone's day. And I don't care if you get to the opposite end, where you're getting to the age where smiling is about all you feel like you can do, you still have a usefulness in the kingdom of God. It never ends. You go into and you hear people talk about, wow, that was the nicest, kindest person they don't talk about all the other things. They talk about the fact that your spirit just made them feel better. You always have a usefulness. You aren't necessarily, you don't have to throw things away. You can find ways to continue to use them. And there's always a usefulness for the kids at home and the adults in the building and the adults at home and whomever else is watching. There's always a use for you in the kingdom of God. Never forget that, okay? And now, to make some of you feel better, I'm going to put this back on the chainsaw and put it back out of your sight. Uh, for those who can near, um, kneel, please kneel for the prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful day that you gave us.
in your Sabbath day. We're so thankful that we can be here in your house this morning. Lord, blessed be your name above all names. Blessed be your kingdom above all kingdoms. You are the greatest God of all. You are our creator, our, our redeemer, and our savior. And we are so thankful that you created us in your image. Dear Lord, please forgive our faults and our sins, our shortcomings, and make us new every single day in your presence. Dear Heavenly Father, we find some people here today that are struggling with many things. And I ask you that you reach their hearts in a very special way and heal any problems that they are going through. Raise them up, Lord. And I also pray in a special way for those in our church family that are fighting COVID-19, that you will put your hand upon them, Lord, and help them to heal and to get better, and that soon they will be able to be here with us. Help their families that are dealing with this disease. Give them strength and the courage that you are in control of everything. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to be with the pastor today, that the message that you put in his heart will be the message that each one of us should hear today, that will go deep in our hearts and minds and will wake, still keep waking us every Sabbath, every week, to stay closer to you, to love you, to love one another, to not let our love go, grow cold, but that we will stand firm in your side, and that soon, Lord, we'll be able to meet you again in person. We love you, and we're very thankful for all the blessings that you give us daily. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We serve a good God, don't we? 
and I uh, want to continue our journey through the Gospel of John. Two weeks ago, we looked at the what and the why of John. What is going on? God's preparing a place for us. Why? Because he has a big heart and a big house. And he wants all of us to be there. Today we're going to look at the who and the how. Who makes this happen and how. And then next week, the where and the when. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it is good to be here, Lord. It's good to hold the Bible in our hands and to be able to open up our hearts to you. And we pray, Lord, we will do that during this time. We pray that you'll speak to each of us, myself and all of us, as we look at these sacred words. Lord, we want to thank you for taking us through this week, and thank you for adopting us as your sons and your daughters. And Lord, we pray that as we look at these words, these familiar words, you'll bring to our remembrance the foundation of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Arthur Burns was a no name that was well known in the Washington, D.C. area. He had served as the uh, ambassador to West Germany. He had served as the Federal Reserve Chairman from Eisenhower to Reagan. Arthur Burns was also Jewish. And, and he would have the habit of still attending the weekly prayer meeting that was held by Christians. Well, everybody in the prayer circle knew that Arthur Burns was Jewish, so they would kind of overpass his name when they were asking someone to pray. Except one day there was a newcomer to the, to the prayer circle, and he didn't know Arthur Burns' religion. So he looked at Arthur Burns and said, Would you pray? And without missing a beat, he said yes. And everybody in that prayer circle was wondering, what is he going to say? He's Jewish, we're Christian. And his prayer became legendary. He said, Lord, I pray that you would bring the Jews to know Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would bring the Muslims to know Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you will bring Christians to know Jesus Christ. Wow. Do we just know about Jesus? Or do we know Jesus? Do we know the facts about his life? Or am I intimately connected with him? Now, two weeks ago, we looked at that famous Bible verse. And turn with me, if you would, in your Bible to so John 14. Famous Bible verse, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has got a lot of rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Now, we remember that he was looking into the eyes of the disciples that were still there in the room. They were now 11. And he tells them, he tells Peter, you know what, you're going to deny me three times. He's already told the other disciples, you're going to go AWOL, and they're upset, and he looks into their eyes and says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, also believe in me. The, con the conversation began with Peter. It's going to go to Thomas and then to Philip. Now, as we pick up the story, we've got to remember something here, that every stomach in that room is full. They've eaten the Passover meal. There are, there, there are, everybody's got clean feet except for one person. His name is Jesus. And so in verse 4, he tells them, he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, this is an interesting statement because Thomas, and we always jump on Thomas's back for being the doubter, but you know what? He asks some good questions. He asks a question that leads us to something we need to know because he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? How can we know the way? Now, now we jump on Peter, on, I'm sorry, on Thomas, the doubting Thomas, but there was something really amazing that Thomas said about three months prior to this. 
Jesus is hinting that he's going to be crucified. And then he says these words, let us also go that we may die with him. Wow. Let us also go that we may die with him. He sees what's going to happen. And he says, I love this guy. I want to die with him. Now, granted, in that upper room, there was a lot of thoughts swirling around in the minds of the disciples. Is this the moment we're going to take over Rome? Is this the time we get rid of the Romans? Or what's this thing about Jesus dying? And what about this thing about going to see the Father? Then, thankfully, Thomas says these words because it brings us to one of the most salvific Bible verses in all of Scriptures. For this opens the door for Jesus to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now what Jesus says is, is as important as what he doesn't say. Because he doesn't say, I know the way. Or I know the truth. Or here is the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, my friend, let me be honest with us and let me step on all of our toes, including my own. And I wish I could say that every pastor will be saved, but we aren't. We can get so wrapped up into studying the Scripture that we forget about the God of the Scripture. We can do all that. And let me be honest with you, the devil doesn't get upset when we study our Sabbath school lessons. He doesn't even get upset when we study the Beatitudes. He doesn't even get upset when we study Daniel Revelation. He just wants to be sure that we don't get to John 14, verse 6. He just wants to keep us from John 14, 6, where we say, wow, Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life. That's what he's afraid of. You know, James reminds us, the devil, even he knows God exists, and he trembles. It was C.S. Lewis who put it like this, nothing gives a more spurously good conscience than keeping rules. If, even if there has been a total absence of real charity and faith. If you ask somebody from Judaism, where is the truth? They will point you to the Torah. If you ask a Muslim, they will point you to the Quran. If you ask a Christian, where is the truth? They will point you. They should point you to Jesus Christ. It isn't the Bible. It is Jesus. Now, now, uh, several decades ago, you might remember this craze going on, and we all kind of got sucked into it. You remember the initials WWJD? What would what? Jesus do. Now, let me be honest with you. That was a huge behavior modification program. <laughs> it was all about what would Jesus do. It, it sounded good. It sold a lot of bookmarks and trinkets and, and necklaces and all this sort of stuff, but that isn't Christianity. Christianity is really saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart. Because you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. Now, as Adventists, we are very cognitive, oriented, logical thinking. Do you know what I mean by that? We just, we, 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 we can see the Sabbath like nobody else can. We can see it all. It makes perfectly good sense to us. We're logical people. Praise God. The problem is you can't explain God. You can't. It was Leo Tolstoy who said, God, God cannot be understood by logical reasoning, but only by submission. That's it. And it was Jesus who spoke a few thousand years prior to this to, the, to, 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 to Moses. I Tell him that I am sent you. Now he is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, we are wise to be skeptics. It took some time for the disciples to warm up to Jesus because when, when they first get on board with Jesus, they, they call him a rabbi. He's a rabbi, which means teacher. Now, it's Thursday night, 
Jesus is about to be crucified, and they're calling, they are addressing him as Lord. And so it's taken them three years for them to start connecting the dots to say, oh, this may be the guy. This is the Messiah. Jesus works with them in their infantile, weak faith. And he says these three words, I am the way. Now, the way implies movement. You're going from point A to point B. You're you're going in a way, in a direction. Matter of fact, the very, very early church wasn't known as Christians. They were known as people of the way. Leo Tolstoy, somebody noted, realized that every human being has to answer six questions. Six questions in life. Why am I living? What is the cause of my existence? Why do I exist? Why is there a division of good and evil in my heart? How must I live? And what is death? How can I save myself? In that upper room, Jesus answered all six of those questions. The eve before his own crucifixion, he addresses all of them in that upper room. And he says, at the end of the day, I am the way. Then he tells, then he says, I am the truth. Now, about an hour from here, there's an institution, you may have called it, heard of it, it's called Harvard University. Their motto is one word. You may have seen the t-shirt around, Veritas, which simply means truth. That's it. Jesus says, I am the truth. Leonard Sweet grew up in a Christian home, but at the age of 17, he decided to deconvert from Christianity. He became an ex-theist, as he puts it like that. And, and he eventually gradually comes back to his faith, his, to his roots, but in, in the process, he goes to talk to a, 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 a theologian about his coming back to the faith. The theologian then confessed to Leonard Sweet. He said, I am in pursuit of truth. Whatever truth is and wherever it is to be found, that is a journey I am on. When I seek truth and find it, and if truth turns out to be two hydrogen atoms that accidentally collided, and no more than that, I will kneel in front of those two atoms and give them my worship and praise. Leonard Sweet was floored by this theologian's answer. And he saw the the, the futility of life. Why go through all this if it comes down to two hydrogen atoms colliding together? Then he came upon the writings of Fyodor Dostoevsky, who in a letter wrote these words, he says, nothing is more perfect than Christ. If someone succeeded in proving to me that Christ was outside the truth, and if in reality the truth was outside Christ, he says, then I should prefer to remain with Christ than with the truth. In other words, this thing, this story, this belief that I have that God created the world and that he came to this world in human flesh is so grandiose, so amazing, I can't have anything else. Now to that professor who said, I'm in pursuit of the truth, I would say, let's look at John 14, 1, don't let your hearts be troubled, but also John 1, 14, which says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Prior to that, you know the words, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and then here's the kicker. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The good news is, Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, one word of truth outweighs the entire world. Now let's face it, we're all in pursuit of the truth. Even Pilate is there 
with the truth, with Jesus. And he says, what is truth? And it was staring him. He was staring him right in the face. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right now I'm sitting with two young people. I have the privilege of doing that. And one of their names is Zoe. I don't know if Zoe's here, but Zoe. Zoe means life. It means life. It means life that God gives to us. It's not the bios type of life. It's Zoe life. Why we're living. The, the way we look at life. And, 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 and Jesus says, I am the life. How often we forget that, don't we? we? We see ourselves as a biological going, orienting through this thing called life. And hopefully you end up in a good place. All the while forgetting that Jesus is the Zoe. Jesus is the life. There's a story about a lady named Betsy who was studying at at Harvard, and, and she said she was, her, her entire life it was pretty much a cakewalk. She could not study and still pull a rabbit out of the hat. She was just one of those gifted people. Well, for her final exam there at Harvard, first final exam, suddenly that evening in the library, she had a moment of fear. She panicked. It was like she froze and could not move any further. She was studying for a sociology exam. And she froze there in the library. And she couldn't do anything. She wasn't even sure how long this panic uh, uh, lasted. It seemed like an eternity. But then in the library, there was an incredible peace that flooded the library. <laughs> and it was as if the Lord said, don't you know that I love you? Don't you know that I love you? And, and Betsy realizes in one split second she had to decide. Was it going to be fear or faith? Was it going to be controlling or was it going to be yielding? There in that library she simply said, yes, God. She said yes to the Zoe, God. And it was as if a brand new perspective came and peace came into her heart. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you really knew me, you would know that my father you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip chimes in, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Now, as I mentioned here, that, that we all remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That on a basic, primal level, every person has physiological needs of food, water, and warmth and shelter. And above that, there's belonging, there's love needs. And above that, there's esteem needs. And finally, the pinnacle is self-actualization. Now, when you think about it, the 11 disciples in that room have reached that pinnacle. They've got a full stomach. They've got safety because Jesus already told them, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. The esteem of feeling part of this group, of being part of, this, of Jesus' circle. All those needs are being met, and then there is that one moment. There's that one moment this, that, that, that Philip says, that's, there's one more thing, Jesus. Show us the Father. Just show us the Father. Give us a glimpse of him. Give us a glimpse of him. That's what we want. Oh, my friends, the quest goes on and on and on and on. I came across a story about a young man named Kirster Sengsing, who grew up as a Hindu and who was fascinated by holiness, fascinated by holy people and holy men. And, and, and he thought, wow, to be a holy person would be incredible. Well, Kirster had an uncle who took a vow of silence after the birth of his first son. Silence, vow of silence in his pursuit of holiness and celibacy. And he would enter a trance-like state through meditation and yoga. Kirster is saying that when he would go visit his cousin, his name was Rabbi, 
his silence, his, his uncle's silence amazed him. He said, he said, I remember how they would, he and his cousin would gaze into his face, hoping for some response, some word, even a smile. But he didn't turn to smile or to speak. Then, Kirster says about his cousin that his, that his uncle died without his son ever hear, having heard his father's voice. Why? The pursuit of holiness. The pursuit of that. And I'm thinking about if only that uncle understood what you and I understand that Jesus showed up, that God showed up with skin on his, uh, on his body, with a beating heart, with flesh, so he could look into our eyes and say, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. But Philip says, show me the Father. M. Basil Pennington put it like this, there is a hunger that is far more acute than the need for bread. There is a deep spiritual hunger. If it is not satisfied, even rich meals will never satisfy it. And so it's true. Here they are, full stomachs. They've got a place of belonging. There they are. And and Philip says, show us the Father. Now you and I, we know the answer. If you want to find God, you find him in a Middle Eastern barn with a mismatched couple holding God in his hand, in their hands. If you want to find God, you will find him in the middle of a storm, calming disciples down and then saying, peace, be still. If you want to find God, you're going to find him on a cross, telling the one next to him, don't let your heart be troubled. There is a place for you. If you want to find God, you're going to look to the Sea of Galilee where he's faced with thousands of hungry people and he says, let's sit them down and we're going to feed them. Jesus says, you don't know me, Philip, even after I've been with you for such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? There's a story I want to share about an experience that happened at a university. It was a debate, one of these classic debates, is there a God? And there were two debaters, William Lane, <clears throat> William Lane Craig and Joseph, Douglas Joseph. One was a Christian, the other one wasn't. Does God exist? Well, you know, usually these patterns, these, these discussions go down the same pattern. The atheist will say, well, look at all the evil and suffering in the world. How could there be a God? How could God allow this? Then the other one says, well, there's, pe- there's empirical evidence that Jesus existed and, 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 and uh, the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Dr. Craig was the Christian. Finally, towards the end, somebody asked him this question. Can you tell us what difference your worldview makes in your own personal lives? Dr. Craig said, I came to know joy for the very first time. (laughs) Believing in God, believing in Jesus Christ saved my life, saved my marriage, gave me a purpose to live. And he says, I can't help but want to share the wonder of Jesus Christ whenever I am welcome to give reason for the hope within me. I can't just keep it to myself. Then there was chance for, then it was an opportunity for the Professor Joseph to respond and and he basically hemmed and hawed, and, and, and he, said, he admitted he wouldn't have much to say. And then he closed with these words, I'd probably go home, put on the Grateful Dead, and play chess with my computer. The person who's sharing this says there was a pregnant pause there in the auditorium with a thousand college students everybody processing what they had just heard and what they hadn't heard. They didn't take a vote about who won the debate. That wouldn't be proper. But they all knew who had won. Because there was one person on that platform that night 
who understood that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Let us pray. Lord, it is more than coincidental that this man named John loved you so much that he went and was sent to an island of Patmos, where he was given a vision of the, of the, of the present and the future. But he leaves there and he writes down this gospel and he also writes one, two, and three, John. At the end of the day, his summary is, God is love. <laughs> after all that he experienced, after the, all that he had seen, after all that he knew, he said, that's it. Lord, we want to thank you for aiming that love at us, right at our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that you loved enough to show up in human form and say that you are the way the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Amen.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 